My name is Jennifer Matthews. I'm a commissioner with the Governor's Commission on Women, and I'm going to be serving as uh, the moderator for this evening's presentation. Uh, tonight's workshop is being sponsored by the Governor's Commission on Women in conjunction with the Women's Bureau Region 1 of the U.S. Department of Labor, as well as the National Committee on Pay Equity. Well, the question of the evening is, does anatomy determine pay? And that is also the title of tonight's workshop. Um, and it's the question that our panelists are going to be discussing with us these, this evening. We're going to be looking at fair pay, wage discrimination, equal pay for comparable work, and how pay inequities contribute to lower retirement benefits for women. We are fortunate to be able to hear from five very knowledgeable women this evening who are going to discuss um, these issues with us. And I think what I will start with is just introducing uh, our panelists to uh, the audience tonight. First of all is Mary Claire Carroll. Mary Claire is the co-director of Women Centered, a resource, support, and education center located in Montpelier, Vermont. She is the current legislative chair and past president of Vermont Business and Professional Women. So I'm going to say welcome to Mary Claire Carroll. St. Jan Johnsbury there. I see some familiar faces from BPW. <laughs> Great. Um, also with us this evening is Jean Lowell, and I think Jean's in Waterbury this evening. Jean is a civil rights investigator with the Vermont Attorney General's Office, and she is responsible for investigating employment discrimination complaints. So I'm going to say good evening, Jean Lowell. Good evening, Jennifer. Hi, Jean. Also with us this evening is Judy Rex. Judy is the coordinator of the Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Good evening, Judy. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, joining us the, this evening via videotape will be Marie-Therese Shisha. Marie-Therese was with us last week when we did a similar workshop. She was unable to be with us this evening, but her presentation is going to come to us uh, via videotape. Uh, just a, a brief intro for Marie-Therese. She is a uh, professor at the School of Industrial relations at the University of Montreal and at re has recently written a book on pay equity. Um, also with us this evening is Christine Moriarty. Uh, Christine is a certified financial planner and she has a background in, account in accounting and small business management and I want to say good evening Christine. Good evening. Hi. What we are going to do this evening is we're going to open with presentations from each of our panelists, uh, running about 15 to 20 minutes per panelist, and then we will be going around the state, site by site, uh, for questions and or comments from our various participants. Uh, if time allows, we will go back through the sites um, and uh, for a, additional questions. Let me just remind people at the various sites that there are packets of information. I'm going to hold mine up here. Packets of information available at the various sites. Uh, these will augment what our panelists are going to be speaking about tonight with uh, a good deal of helpful written information. So please make sure that you do pick one of these up. Okay, I'm going to start this evening's uh, discussion with sort of a framework, looking at four very crucial pieces of information. First of all, for every dollar a man earns, a woman makes only 71 cents. Second of all, a woman will lose, on average, over $420,000 in her lifetime due to pay inequity. Third, on an annual collective basis, women lose over $100 billion in wages due to wage discrimination. And finally, to bring this home to Vermont, a woman with a college degree, with a bachelor's degree, earns less in the state of Vermont than a man with a high school diploma. I'd say we've got a problem here. We've got a problem that not only affects women, 
It affects our children, our families, our communities, uh, our, our state as a whole. So with those sort of bits of information in mind, let's begin this evening's discussion. We're going to start with Mary Claire Carroll. Mary Claire is going to define the concept of fair pay for us and also discuss the Federal Fair Pay Act. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary Claire Carroll. Thanks, Jennifer. Tonight, my role is to talk about pay inequity and how it affects our lives, our work, and our economy. First, as Jennifer said I would, let me define the word pay equity. It is a means of eliminating sex, race, and ethnic origin discrimination in the wage setting system. In other words, equal treatment for all workers. Think about this. On April 11, 1997, women earned what men earned in the calendar year of 1996. It takes us over four months of the new year, plus all of the previous year, to earn a comparable salary. The most recent ratio I read puts her earnings at about 71 cents for every dollar a man earns. You've heard the ratio before, but what does it mean? The National Committee on Pay Equity estimates that that, that ratio means that women l lose about $420,000 in salary and pension benefits over a lifetime. What would you do with an extra $420,000? Go back to school, save for your child's education, improve your standard of living, for your retirement, buy a house, a car. That gap translates into lost pay and benefits for all working women. The National Committee on Pay Equity estimates that collectively wage discrimination means a loss of $130 billion to the nation's economy. Keeping that in mind, let's give the issue some perspective. Pay equity is not a new issue. In 1919, the Federation of Business and Professional Women, known as BPW, considered a major issue at their first national convention in St. Louis. Almost 50 years later, BPW and many other women's organizations successfully won passage of the 1963 Equal Pay Act and finally the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Those laws were supposed to make sure that there would be equal pay for equal work. Over 10 years after their passage in the mid-70s, women's salaries stood at a recent historic low of 57% of men's wages. 30 years after their passage, women and minorities still experience wage discrimination. These bills have been difficult to enforce and did not address the issue of occupational inequity, inequities, as you will hear later. The historic stereotypes concerning women's work that are present in our job market continue to perpetuate the inequities. Some of these stereotypes mean that traditionally female jobs are valued less, therefore pay less. Jobs with feminine characteristics, i.e. nurturing, receive lower pay. Men and women earn less in predominantly female fields, but in some cases, the men still earn more than women. The main problem is that we continue to undervalue and underpay work done by women and minorities. This happens in traditional jobs, non-traditional occupations, and even in jobs covered by the Equal Pay Act. Last year, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that male nurses were paid $1,144 more per year than female nurses. Male secretaries, stenographers, and typists earn 12% more than female secretaries and male elementary school teachers earned about 12% more than their female counterparts. Whether women are the overwhelming majority of workers in a job or are breaking into male-dominated fields, they have difficulty earning equal pay. For example, women now count for 30% of all lawyers, yet they earn 22% less than male attorneys, or about $11,000 less per year. 29% of computer programmers are women, but they earn 12% or $4,000 less per year. In Vermont, female cooks make about $275 a week compared to male cooks earning $331. Female police officers earn about $571 compared to a man's $670 per week. For physicians, the median weekly pay was $806 for women versus 
1,241 for men. Women working in financial and security operations earned a median $506 per week, while men earned $936 per week. These are a few examples that show how e the equal pay for women has yet to be achieved. The gap has been narrowed thanks to more opportunities in education, the increasing participation of women in non-traditional jobs. Yet the fact that highly educated and skilled physicians, attorneys, and other professionals experience unequal pay shows how pervasive the wage gap is. For these women and those working more traditional female-dominated jobs, wage discrimination is a grim economic reality, one that affects their economic security but also the security of their families. The wage gap also affects the country's economic future. As we become a larger portion of the nation's workforce, it just doesn't make good business sense to pay us less. In 1995, 60 million women were either working or looking for work. We made up approximately 43% of the nation's full-time workers. The 71% the ratio I mentioned earlier is an all-time high for women. Yet during the last 20 years, 60% of our progress in narrowing that gap can be attributed to the fall in men's real earnings. So college education helps women and minorities improve earning, but it doesn't significantly narrow the wage gap. Women who hold bachelor degrees earn only $2,190 more per year than white men who have never taken one college course and $12,000 $12, less than college-educated white men. I just read recently about a um, article about women with MBAs who just recently graduated from business school with their MBAs, and they're entering their workforce already uh, earning $12,000 less than their male compatriots. Today, 60% of all women continue to work in traditional female jobs where the work itself is undervalued and underpaid. It is not that these jobs are low skill or lacking in effort or responsibility. Society does not seem to value taking care of the sick, guiding the development of young children, cataloging and managing lar large volumes of literature and publications, and ensuring the efficient administrative operations of our nation's businesses. Yet there are critical functions within our economy and our society. These jobs and others take education and skill and are just as important as men's work. But let me say this again. The compensation received for this work does not reflect the value of that work to this society or to our economy. Look at how this affects the economy. 18 million families depend on the wages of a working mother. And 7.6 million families are headed solely by a working mother. There are seven times as many women raising families alone as there are men raising families. Less than 15% of all American families with children fit the traditional model of breadwinner father and an at-home mother. Wage discrimination means, quite simply, that the whole family suffers. Pay inequity contributes to the growing income inequality of families and makes the cycle of poverty harder to break. Since 1979, the wealthiest and upper middle class income families have seen their income rise between 18 and 5 percent. Those in the middle and at the bottom are struggling with falling wages and have experienced income losses from 3 to 7 percent. Women's income is needed more than ever to help preserve the standard of living for our nation's families. Most women work to provide food, clothing, and shelter for their families. For most women, work is a necessity. It's not just something we're doing for pin money. Pay inequity makes it particularly difficult for lower income women to break out of the cycle of poverty and dependency on public assistance programs. Often traditional jobs in the, admi in the administrative clerical and service fields and do not provide income or benefits needed to sustain a family. Many women must turn to government assistance for basic needs. One study showed that a pay equity raise of approximately 9%, that's it, just 9%, would enable nearly 40% of poor working women to rise above poverty level. As today's female workers age, they will experience ever great, even greater gaps in salaries. 
and recent figures show that women aged 55 to 59 earn only 58.9 percent of what their male contemporaries earn. What that means is by the time most women reach retirement, they will have to lower their standard of living. For many, retirement means poverty. Earlier I mentioned that wage discrimination collectively meant a loss to the economy of $130 billion. That figure was from 1994. By 2005, women and minorities will account for 62% of all workers. What will that mean for the economy when the majority of our workers are undervalued and underpaid? Wage discrimination is linked to other important issues affecting our economy such as the glass ceiling, affirmative action, and welfare reform. Affirmative action has opened the door to many positive opportunities for women and minorities. The U.S. Department of Labor glass ceiling report confirmed that on rare occasions, when women and minorities do get the executive job and higher title, they do not get the salary that goes along with it. This pay inequity contributes to the barrier that women and minorities face when breaking into upper level management and professional jobs. It places a lower value on their work and makes them appear like cheaper goods. I could cite hundreds of statistics, personal stories, and give more detailed reasons why wage discrimination is bad for the economy. Look at your own work situation, at your coworkers, your relatives. What stories do they tell? Here's what you might hear. The Women's Count survey from the Department of Labor found that women's top concerns where the pay and benefits should provide economic security. That the workplace culture needed to be more supportive of families. And that opportunity should reflect the value of women's work. Almost 50% of women said, I don't get paid what I think my job is worth. It is no longer a question of does wage discrimination exist. It does. Wage discrimination has a devastating effect on our economy and on women's ability to create economic security for themselves and families. I urge you to start talking to your elected officials, your employers, your coworkers, and your friends. Tell them to support the Fair Pay Act of 1997 and the Paycheck Fairness Act recently introduced in Congress. The Fair Pay Act is designed to eliminate discrimination in the wage setting process based on gender, race, or national origin. It would require that employers pay equal pay for jobs that are com comparable in skill, experience, responsibility, effort, and working conditions. This bill has the strong support of Senator Leahy in the Senate and Congressman Sanders in the House. They are both co-sponsors of the bill, and they've spoken out in favor of the passage of the bill many, many times. However, Senator Jeffords does not support it despite steadying lobby efforts by Vermont BPW and the Governor's Commission on Women. The Paycheck Fairness Act amends the Equal Pay Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to provide more effective remedies to women who are not being paid equal wages for doing equal work. There's a non-retaliation provision which prohibits employers from penalizing employees for sharing information about salaries with their coworkers. It also allows for punitive and compensatory, compensatory damages not now available under the EPA. Without adequate damages, there is little or no deterrent effort effect, I'm sorry, effect for employers. Another provision increases the resources necessary for enforcement and education concerning the Equal Pay Act. So I urge you again. Please tell our congressional representatives how you feel about these bills and how you feel about pay inequity. And again, tell your coworkers and employees about pay equity and the legislative solutions available. Help them understand that pay equity is above all about fairness and about how our work is valued. It is time that the full value of our skills and contributions to the labor force were recognized. It is time for us to be paid fairly for our work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary Claire Carroll. 
Uh, as I was listening to your, your presentation, I was trying to make a list of the, the various occupations that you mentioned that uh, where, there, where pay mm -hmm. inequity exists. I couldn't keep up with you, as a matter of fact. <laughs> there are too we, many. We, right. We mentioned nurses, secretaries, teachers, cooks, police officers, physicians. Don't and forget lawyers, attorneys, computer, this, programmers, this. attorneys, financial investment people, yeah. bankers. Right. It seems to permeate the various careers yes. and professions. Yes, it does. And so again, I will hold up the pamphlet that uh, was sent out by the Governor's Commission to uh, announce these workshops. And on it is a drawing of a little boy and a little girl and sort of looking in their underpants there and with the explanation, oh, that explains the difference in our pay. And with what Mary Claire has said, That's it true. appears that gender is definitely a deciding factor. Uh, I know there's a number of us here this evening that w deal with the effects of the feminization of poverty on a, on a daily basis, and pay inequity is definitely a contributing factor to that. Um, as we begin to deal with the repercussions of welfare reform, I think this is a, uh, an opportunity to address this, and um, the time is definitely now. So again, my thanks to Mary Claire Carroll. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, one of the public access channels here in Vermont, Channel 14, is broadcasting and taping tonight's workshop. So uh, just wanted to uh, let everybody know that. Next we're going to go to Jean Lowell. Jean's going to discuss wage discrimination and how to go about filing a wage discrimination complaint here in Vermont. So I'm going to turn it over to Jean Lowell at this point. Thank you, Jennifer. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm a civil rights investigator. I work with the Vermont Attorney General's Office. And uh, in my capacity as an investigator, I investigate complaints of employment discrimination under both state and federal laws. My office serves as what's called a deferral agency for the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and investigates complaints filed under uh, laws in EEOC's jurisdiction as well as state law. Um, the complaints that we investigate are uh, applied to private employers as opposed to uh, complaints which might be filed against the private sec the public sector of the state of Vermont. Those complaints are handled by the Vermont Human Rights Commission, which is a separate and distinct entity from the Attorney General's office. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about wage discrimination as a subset of sex discrimination. Wage discrimination as a subset of sex discrimination is when an employer pays a male employee more than a female employee for performing the same or equal work. <clears throat> Under certain circumstances, doing so is unlawful. Wage discrimination manifests at every stage of an individual's career. At the entry level of uh, any given profession, wage discrimination is not as prevalent as it may be further along down the line. And the reason for that is that wage discrimination manifests as a result of uh, various subjective criteria that are applied by employers in determining the wage levels of their employees. Such subjective criteria um, involve how an employer credits relevant work experience, how an employer evaluates work performance, and how an employer uh, engages in the assignment of various jo job assignments and opportunities which might lead to increased compensation or specialized work experience that in turn translates into uh, advancement opportunities and higher levels of pay. We've heard mention of the glass ceiling, and I think everyone is aware of what that is at this point. The glass ceiling, of course, is uh, that phenomenon where women in the corporate world tend to rise to a certain level within a corporate entity, and then, as if by some 
magic, they don't rise any further above that. There's another phenomenon which influences wage discrimination, and that's what's come to be referred to as the glass wall. The glass wall phenomenon is when men and women appear to be at an equal level with each other, but the women cannot break into certain uh, uh, realms within that level of employment, such as which might involve job assignments, for example, that I mentioned earlier, which in turn would lead to advancement opportunities further down the road <clears throat> in that career. As awareness increases around issues of pay equity, some employers resort to uh, more uh, sophisticated means of um, being able to pay certain favored classes of employees more than other classes of employees for doing the same or equal work. For example, employers have begun to assign different job titles and lend different language to job descriptions for positions which are essentially the same in terms of the knowledge, the skills, the level of responsibility and the working conditions under which the positions, the jo jobs are performed. Another way employers have come to justify um, paying certain classes of employees higher wages and as a way of segregating other classes of employees from having access to those positions is to require, to impose a higher level of experience or other job requirements in order to enter into a given field. Um, an example of that might be um, maintenance workers versus housekeepers, housekeepers being predominantly female a female-dominated profession, maintenance workers being historically at least a uh, male-dominated profession. The maintenance worker category in as it's performed may not require anything greater than the housekeeping profession, but in order to get into that job, there may be a, a weightlifting requirement, for example, that in effect would eliminate uh, greater numbers of females from qualifying for the job when, as performed, that weight requirement is not necessary a, at all. Identifying such discriminatory practices is extremely difficult without access to information such as the exact requirements of a job how, as it is performed um, and the ability to closely examine whether an employer is establishing criteria or applying cri criteria in a non-discriminatory manner. The various pieces of legislation which exist, presently exist, which help protect against such discriminatory practices include Vermont's Fair Employment Practices <coughs> Act, Title VII of the Federal uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Equal Pay Act, which uh, Mary Claire Carroll spoke briefly to before. Vermont's Fair Employment Practices Act is uh, interpreted and applied generally as the federal laws and federal court decisions apply. It's broader and more favorable in that uh, in order to file a complaint under the Fair Employment Practices Act, a, a discrimination complaint that is, there are no minimum number of employees, whereas the federal laws require a minimum of number of employees of 15. Um, in Vermont, in Vermont under the under FIPA, you, the employer only has to employ at least one individual. In order to, and and also another distinction between state and federal law is that under Fair Employment Practices Act, an individual can <coughs> file a complaint directly in court as opposed to having to go through the Attorney General's office or through the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act allows for, uh, pr protects against wage discrimination based on a full range of protected categories such as race, national origin, age, etc., not just sex. And it is uh, more generously applied by the U.S. Supreme Court than the Equal Pay Act, which I will speak to in a moment, 
in that it does allow for a comparable work analysis to be applied in determining whether unlawful wage discrimination has taken place. The Equal Pay Act itself is broader than its federal counterpart, Title VII, in some respects and narrower in others. It is more generous to complainants in that the burden of proof under the Equal Pay Act is placed on the employer to show that a factor other than sex formed the basis of whatever wage disparity has been shown to exist. This is significantly different in that other federal and state laws leave the burden on the employee to have to prove that sex was a factor that led to the wage disparity. I think it's interesting to note that a number of defenses have been rejected by the courts in uh, evaluating wage discrimination claims. For example, an employer's offered defense that wage, a wage disparity was the result of um, market rate or industry practice or some other economic benefit to the employer has been rejected by the courts as a defense, and I think that this is an indication that the courts recognize that wage discrimination has become so endemic in the marketplace that such wage discrimination cannot be allowed to be perpetuated by letting employers resort to that as a defense. Similarly, an employee's former wage rate cannot be used by an employer under, as, as the courts have applied these standards cannot be used by an employer to justify paying some a woman, for example, less than a man. Again, I think this speaks to the court's recognition that wage discrimination has been endemic in our marketplace and cannot be perpetuated by allowing employers to fall back on that defense. Um, another important defense which has been rejected by the courts is the old head of household status defense. And that is uh, an, an old way of thinking that men are the primary breadwinners bread in the family and that therefore they justifiably should be allowed to be paid more for the same work that a woman is performing. I'd like to speak a little bit about the obstacles as I see them that are presented to filing this filing complaints of wage discrimination. For one thing, although there is a, a growing awareness of this issue, generally people are not aware of either the issue or, more importantly, their rights in protecting themselves against wage discrimination. A more significant obstacle, however, to pursuing one's rights under the various state and federal laws protecting against wage discrimination is that it is very, very difficult to access information about one's co the wages of one's co-workers or the nature of their job description as it's performed compared to one's own. Indeed, it's not only difficult to access information about actual duties, responsibilities, skill level, etc., but it is often, uh, it would often put one at risk of disciplinary action to try to elicit that kind of information or talk about it within the workplace. There's also fear associated with possibly alienating one's coworkers against whom one has to compare oneself, especially when it's not the coworkers' fault and it's threatening to the coworkers' own livelihood. Uh, for, for an employee to be pointing the finger and saying, hey, how come I'm not making as much as, as he's making? And of course, there's the fear of retaliation by the employer uh, for anyone who might dare raise the specter of, of wage discrimination in the workplace. And last but not least, I fear that there is a diminished faith in the resources available for redress of wage discrimination. Um, every agency that I know of is extremely overburdened 
their resources are limited, the demands on those resources are greater and greater, and the time frame within which agencies can respond to such complaints becomes more and more protracted, which has, I believe, a chilling effect on individuals' uh, willingness to come forward and raise such complaints. I think it's worth mentioning before I close, um, summarizing a bit about the Fair Pay Act that's presently before Congress. Mary Claire Carroll spoke of it, but I, I think it's worth reiterating. As Mary mentioned, the Fair Pay Act establishes legislatively the comparable work standard as opposed to the equal work standard that has been established under the Equal Pay Act. The equal work standard as has been applied to the Equal Pay Act is extremely narrow and restrictive. It essentially requires that a that a job that's being compared to get to another job be essentially the same, only minimal differences. The, the comparable work standard that would be established legislatively under the Fair Pay Act, as Mary mentioned earlier, allows for different jobs, different job titles to be compared in terms of the degree of skill, the nature of skill, the level of responsibility, the degree of effort, and the working conditions under which the jobs have to be performed. It's a much more generous and friendly standard for people who believe they are being uh, discriminated against in terms of their wages. Another most important provision of the Fair Pay Act is that it legislatively provides for access to information regarding the nature and requirements of positions and their wages to individuals who have any reason to suspect or fear that they're not being paid comparably for the work that they're performing. And of course, it prohibits employers from making discussion of such matters in the workplace grounds for discipline. Uh, perhaps most importantly is it applies to race and national origin too, broadening the uh, uh, specter that is presently covered by the Equal Pay Act. That's it. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you very much, Jean Lowell. So at, at this point, uh, we've had Mary Claire Carroll discuss with us what pay equity and pay inequity are. Uh, Jean has outlined some of the um, uh, uh, difficult discriminatory practices that exist at the moment, um, the current barriers that are out there to determine wage discrimination, and the current legislation that is in place to address wage discrimination. Now we're going to hear from Judy Rex, who is going to give us a specific uh, case of pay inequity that recently uh, occurred here in the state of Vermont. I think she's going to outline the case for us and then tell us about its outcome as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Judy Rex at this point. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, first, I just want to let people know that um, I was actually not part, I was not one of the persons who um, was actually being discriminated against. And just to note that the, um, it actually involved the victim advocates who work for the Victims Assistance Program and even though the, this actually took place in the late 80s, and I think it was resolved in 1990, and it's seven years later, and they still um, don't feel comfortable to talk about it publicly because they still work in their jobs, and they still feel um, the repercussions from the action that they took. So it is very, very difficult uh, for people to come forward and, and seek some sort of redress. What actually happens, and it's ironic because in the late 80s, the state of Vermont embarked on an effort to create pay equity. Um, and they um, actually looked at classified positions and um, exempt positions. I think when they did the classified um, positions, it was called the Willis Study. I don't remember what it was called when they looked at the exempt. But within the Department of State's attorneys, all of the positions were exempt. And a consultant came in and looked at the various jobs. And, a determined, and it was using very objective criteria. Um, on 
skill level and the degree of difficulty and stress and things like that. Um, the, they made a determination that, in fact, um, two positions within the department were comparable. Uh, one was the victim's advocate position and the other was an, an investigative position. They were both, uh, it was determined that both should be um, assigned a pay grade of 20. Now, within pay, in, within pay grades, there are steps. So each year at uh, your anniversary, you can go up another step and you get a pay increase. But what they did when they slotted um, the victim advocates and the investigators into that pay grade, um, they took into um, consideration the investigators' years of experience and they slotted all of the investigators at a pay grade, I, I believe it was either at pay grade seven or, or nine and above. So they were in the upper end of the, the um, pay grade. All the victim advocates um, were slotted. They didn't take into consideration their experience, and they were all slotted at pay grade three or below. And I, you know, not surprisingly, um, all the victim advocates were women, and all the investigators were men. And the result of that was um, a, a significant um, difference in their in their hourly wage um, of it was as much as three or four dollars, and even higher in some cases, depending if you were an advocate at step one and investigator at step 12 or 13. So, um, and it was brought to, the, it, one of the victim advocates um, realized this, and, I, and actually I don't recall how she, she actually found the information, um, but, she, and she brought it to the attention of the department um, repeatedly, um, really didn't get uh, much of a response. Um, I then stepped in, came in as the coordinator of the program, um, so I was technically management. Um, <laughs> And um, I, that was one of the first things I had to do was, is look at it, investigate it, and, and, and come back to the um, executive director of the department with a recommendation. And having looked into it, I, it was very clear to me this was a classic case of sex discrimination, and clearly there was a pay equity there that needed to be fixed. Uh, when I made that recommendation to the executive director, um, there was a great deal of resistance. Um, and honestly, I, I, it's my belief, and this is just my personal assessment that um, there was the, the culture of that department, there was the, a belief um, that in fact the investigators' work was more important than the victim advocates' work. And um, there were, um, I also believe the other factor was that, that, that egos were involved in this and that when we brought it to the attention of, of um, man, you know, the, the, the executive director, um, that there was just a real unwillingness to admit that a mistake had been made or that this, that this was wrong. Um, and so what happened was um, the department became very entrenched um, and resistant to making any changes or even hearing it uh, to the point where I, um, quite frankly, did not feel safe to even talk about it with my boss anymore, that it just, that either I was going to get fired or, um, I mean, it was just, it was so uncomfortable. Um, so at that point, the victim advocate, um, one of the victim advocates hired an attorney and, and brought the case to the Human Rights Commission, which is what you have to do if you're a state employee. The state, uh, the Human Rights Commission investigated the case um, and actually um, came back with a recommendation that not just one victim advocate pursue this, but that it should be a class action suit that all the victim advocates um, were in the same boat, so to speak. Um, so that happened. and. Um, the Human Rights Commission did uh, make a finding that it was, in fact, discrimination, and that was made public. Um, and um, at that, even after that happened, you know, an outside objective body ruled that it was discriminatory. Um, there was still tremendous resistance in the department to fix the mistake, um, and it was really the the cult, the environment that people were working in was very, very uncomfortable. It was it was a very difficult time. Um, for those victim advocates who were playing a very active role in, in getting this litigated. Um, and there wasn't any, I can't say there was any retaliatory action, but it was just the, the atmosphere, the work environment that was just very uncomfortable. It didn't feel safe. Um, and it's to the victim advocates' credit that I think they really stuck with this and pursued it and didn't um, give in and didn't settle for something less than they deserved. Um, and fortunately, um, the, the state did come around. Um, and eventually they settled, and, and not only did they raise all of the advocates, um, um, raise their um, 
they skipped all these steps and got up on the, on the higher end of the, the pay grade, so they were in line with all the investigators. They also went back and retroactively um, compensated them um, to, to back to that time when they, they made the mistake, which was very, um, I was actually surprised by that. Um, so, and like I said, it, it's, it's now been um, seven years, but there's still some hard feelings, and, and, and the victim advocates that we contacted just didn't feel comfortable coming here tonight to talk about it. And so um, I guess uh, I'm here to say that um, I think it's important that you ask questions and don't assume um, that your employer, whether it's the state of Vermont or a private employer, um, is looking out for your best interest or um, is doing it is fair. Um, and it's, I think it is important um, for people to ask questions about pay, you know, their pay and other people's pay and job descriptions and, and equity. And, and, and to also, if they feel that something's wrong, is to, to really pursue um, some redress through, certainly the, if it's a private employer through so the Attorney General's office or um, if the state, the state of Vermont, to do it through the Human Rights Commission. Great. Thank you very much, Judy Rex. Uh, so now we've had a, an illustration of a classic case of pay inequity, and um, I, I think, you know, given the construct of society at present, uh, the fact that women's work is worth less, is valued less, we keep hearing uh, through all of our panelists' presentations, uh, courage and perseverance is definitely needed when, uh, when uh, uh, addressing these pay inequities. Um, next, we are going to hear from R Marie Therese Shisha via videotape. Marie Therese was uh, instrumental in bringing about the model legislation in Quebec to address pay inequity. Uh, the Governor's Commission on Women has begun a serious study of pay inequity here in the state and looking at ways to rectify the situation. One of the models we have looked at is the Quebec model, um, a really excellent model. And so now I think we will go to the tape and learn more about Quebec's model. So if we could roll that tape, please. model that we here in uh, Vermont might want to pursue, uh, if not nationwide. And to discuss uh, Quebec's pay equity legislation, I'm going to turn it over to Marie Therese. Thank you, Jennifer. So I'm going to uh, explain a little bit how we uh, obtained this legislation and then what it contains. Uh, the history of uh, the adoption of this uh, legislation is quite uh, recent. Yeah. Uh, in 1991, um, the Human Rights Commission uh, asked the government to um, adopt a le uh, what is called the proactive legislation on pay equity. But uh, the government of that time didn't uh, really uh, answer this uh, request. And for the next uh, four or five years, it remained uh, uh, quite um, on the side. Uh, and, but uh, in the meantime, there is a fair pay, um, pay equity coalition that was uh, constituted in Quebec and that uh, maintained uh, the interest on this uh, subject. So in 1994, a new government uh, came into uh, power, uh, the Parti Québécois government, and one of this uh, is on its uh, electoral platform, the pay equity legislation was promised. Uh, and um, in December 1994, they put on um, a task force uh, trying uh, to uh, prepare a document about what uh, this sort of legislation should contain. Uh, and um, in the middle of 1995, uh, uh, the task force presented a document that was uh, 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 submitted to public hearings, public hearings to a group of employers, a uh, group of uh, women, uh, and uh, unions, uh, and I was uh, chairing the committee that made these hearings, and then we uh, presented to the minister uh, a, um, a report about what should uh, such a legislation contain uh, after uh, hearing all the concerned groups. And this uh, legislation, well, between the report uh, that we presented and the legislation that was adopted uh, last November, there are some differences. We don't have any uh, power on the um, political uh, process, but uh, the legislation contains most of our uh, recommendations. And uh, in uh, November 1997, by this year, uh, all um, employers in Quebec having 10 employees or more 
must uh, uh, abide uh, are submitted to this uh, legislation. So this is, uh, in short, how it was obtained. Uh, two things uh, have to be um, retained from this uh, story, short story. The first is that uh, there was an ongoing uh, work on pay equity by a group of women during all the time since 1991. So the, maybe it wasn't on the public um, uh, place, but there was work going on this uh, topic, uh, a very strong uh, research and uh, uh, trying to uh, raise conscious consciousness on this uh, subject. And the other thing is that uh, there, there is a need uh, to have a political party uh, that is favorable to this uh, question. This happened in Ontario in 1988 when there was a liberal uh, government, uh, well, the, co the political context was favorable and they adopted such a legislation. In Quebec it happened in 1994. So uh, what has to really to be kept in mind is that work has to be uh, maintained on this by groups. So if the chance arrives that you have a political party that is favorable, you don't leave that chance uh, go by without uh, taking it, uh, without profiting, uh, benefiting from it. Because it, came, it comes once and maybe it cannot come another time. So you have to be always uh, very uh, uh, conscious of this. Now why uh, this legislation was uh, necessary in Quebec? In Quebec, uh, Quebec was the first uh, um, legislation, uh, uh, the first government in the, um, Canada to have a uh, uh, legislation prohibiting uh, unequal value. And this was in 1976. In the Charter of Rights and Freedom of Quebec, there is a section, section 19, that uh, uh, prohibits uh, discrimina pay discrimination uh, between works um, on equal, of equal value done by, uh, on the basis of sex. So it, it's quite uh, old uh, that we have this uh, principle in the Charter. It's not new. But uh, the 20 years experience showed that uh, this is very ineffective to proceed this way. As you mentioned, uh, as Jean mentioned, it takes a very long time. You have to go before the courts to make a proof of discrimination. And in the case of comparable works or pay equity, it's a very complex uh, proof to make, uh, to uh, measure the value of each uh, job, uh, and then to compare it, to compare the wages. is beyond the power or the expertise of any uh, worker. So the workers who benefited from this legislation were unionized, ma mainly unionized. And it uh, brings so a sort of uh, two types of uh, population, women who can benefit from this type of legislation, uh, which are unionized, and those, most of uh, the other women yeah, workers, non-unionized, <laughs> cannot benefit of such a legislation. Uh, so that's uh, for a legislation based on complaints uh, and uh, even those who benefit, uh, to give you an idea of how long it takes, there is a case that uh, was uh, submitted to the Human Rights Commission in 1981, and we are now in 1997 and it's still not settled. <laughs> and this is just bef before, uh, be, uh, before the Human Rights Commission. Now, if it's settled and uh, one of the parties doesn't agree, it will go to the courts, uh, and it may take another 10 years. So you can imagine, even for successful uh, uh, complaints, successful in the sense that they can at least uh, um, give a, um, elements of proof, uh, it takes a very long time. So it's really inefficient, and that's why a proactive legislation is uh, absolutely essential if we want to um, erase pay discrimination. Uh, proactive legislation, what is, what is it? It's a legislation that requires from every employer to do the, uh, the exercise to compare female jobs and male jobs, uh, the value of female jobs, and to compute the value of female jobs and male jobs. And if these jobs are of equal value, then uh, if there is a wage discrep uh, this, uh, discrepancy, to, uh, just to adjust the wages of female jobs. I don't know if it's clear. I hope it's clear. Yes. But uh, you don't need to have a complaint and to make a proof, it just uh, the, the employer has to do it and he has a, uh, a sort of um, calendar to, to do this. He cannot take a very long, uh, he cannot do it as his own uh, 
pace. He has to follow some uh, precise uh, dates. So uh, now I'm going to talk about the content of uh, the Quebec legislation. Uh, first of all, the scope of this legislation. As I said, it covers all the employers who have 10 employees and more. So it goes quite, uh, it's quite extensive. Uh, and um, it covers all the workers, whether they are uh, temporary workers, uh, on contracts, uh, part-time workers, all workers are covered by this legislation. So small size firms, atypical workers or precarious workers, uh, all are covered. And why this is uh, why is this important? It's because women are concentrated in small size firms uh, rather than in large size firms. First of all, and women are also uh, uh, form a large part of uh, what is called the non-standard workers or precarious workers. So, if the legislation didn't cover these two types of uh, uh, two categories it would have uh, been restricted to a small um, uh, amount uh, population of women workers. This is for the scope. Now, a uh, uh, characteristic of this legislation is that it extends uh, democracy at work. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, it's really uh, based on the participation of uh, workers, uh, worker represent representatives, uh, it says it requires uh, the establishment of what is called pay equity committees in each uh, firm. Uh, this pay equity committee uh, must, uh, uh, is composed of uh, representatives of the employers and representatives of the workers. And not only unionized workers, even non-unionized workers have to, uh, must have representatives on this committee. Uh, Two-thirds of the members are workers and one-third are uh, representative of the employers. And among the workers, this is one of the legislation requirements, 50% must be women. So uh, this is what I mean by extending democracy, like women who are the first uh, workers to have an interest in this uh, legislation are uh, well represented in the committees. Uh, now, to, uh, to make this uh, participation effective, because participation is uh, just to be there is not enough. There are three uh, things in the legislation that uh, helps uh, this participation. The first is training. Uh, the employer have to g uh, must give training to the members of the pay equity committee, training on uh, how to do pay equity. Pay equity is in some aspects stati a statistical uh, process. Uh, so they have to learn about uh, all these technical um, aspects because they are responsible of the process of pay equity in the firm. And another very important uh, aspect of training is training on gender bias. Because if they are not aware of what is gender bias in a work, uh, they can understand very well the, tec uh, the technical aspects, but it's not enough. So training has to, uh, to, uh, to do with these two aspects. Well, the, the legislation talks about training, it doesn't talk about the content, but uh, this is uh, something that is uh, really um, important. And then uh, another thing is information. Members of the committee must, uh, the employer must give them information, all the information needed to do the process of pay equity, including uh, information on wages, inform on uh, all the elements uh, needed to, uh, to compare the jobs and the wages. And then the last thing is posting. Uh, when the, they do the work of uh, pay equity, all the different stages, uh, the results of the stages must be posted in the firm in a place that is uh, easily accessible to uh, employers, to employees, so they can go and see if um, the process is fair. If they have questions, uh, they have uh, 60 days to ask the questions about the results, and then the employers must uh, respond and uh, if it's uh, necessary, uh, modify the results of the pay equity process. So this is for the participation, which is uh, really a characteristic of the Quebec legislation. Uh, it's a unique characteristic that, is not, uh, that was not in the other legislation on pay equity. Now, uh, the next point I'm going to talk about, what is the pay equity plan? Because all the process is based on the pay equity plan. So what is the pay equity plan? Uh, as uh, 
uh, it was mentioned before, pay equity consists mainly to compare um, jobs that uh, uh, obviously are very different. Like uh, it's, uh, nurses and policemen have been compared in Ontario, and their jobs have been uh, found uh, of equal value. So the wages of the nurses were adjusted, uh, raised to uh, reach the same as the policemen. Uh, you have accountants uh, that have been compared to, um, uh, for instance, uh, nurses too in other um, types of uh, firms. So these jobs are very different. How do you compare? People say you compare oranges and apples. So if you want to compare oranges and apples, you, have, you compare them on the basis of calories, for instance. <laughs> so if you want to compare nurses and policemen, you have to find a, a standard, a, a common standard to compare these two different jobs. And you find these common standards by doing the pay equity plan. So the, the first step of the pay equity plan is to uh, identify what jobs are you going to compare. So you have to, uh, first of all, identify what are the female jobs in your firm and what are the male jobs. Some are obviously female jobs like secretaries or, uh, or uh, nurses, and some are uh, obviously female, uh, male jobs like plumbers or um, programmers. Uh, but uh, it's not always so obvious. So uh, the legislation gives how to do, uh, how to identify the, the jobs. I, I'm not going to give the details because I won't uh, have enough time. Uh, so this is the first step. What are you going to compare? And then uh, the second step is the tools to compare this, to compare these jobs. So uh, the committee, uh, the pay equity committee, has to uh, to develop tools to compare these jobs. And uh, one of the tools is, uh, of course, the method, uh, which is uh, one of the methods is, that is always, uh, often used is what is called the points and factors method, where uh, you, you make a plan uh, based on four factors, which is uh, qualifications, responsibility, uh, work um, conditions, and efforts, mental as well as physical efforts. These are the four factors uh, that you use to compare all jobs. And then these factors have also some sub-factors, like if you take uh, qualifications, you, have, you may have a school uh, diploma, or you can have, uh, for instance, uh, dexterity, uh, manual dexterity for uh, some jobs. It depends on uh, the type of firm where you, uh, you want to do the evaluation. You divide into sub-factors. Uh, once you have divided in these sub-factors, uh, the next step is to uh, give some weight to these factors. Like if you take a hospital, uh, you will uh, give more weight to a factor like um, taking care of people, uh, if you uh, responsibility of people. If you take, a, uh, for instance, a mining uh, enterprise, uh, you will give more weight to physical uh, effort, for instance. It depends on the type of uh, uh, firm that where you do the but the main point of this exercise is really to make visible the invisible aspects of women's work. Because what we noticed, what researchers uh, have noticed by studying women's work is that many aspects of this work are uh, invisible or are underestimated and uh, are under, um, they are moderated. And um, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't have always the right words. I hope that you understand me. Uh, I want to give two examples of this that are quite striking in my opinion. Uh, if uh, you think about uh, a job that is done in a dirty, in dirty, dirtiness, a job that is uh, in a context of uh, dirtiness, I'm sure that you're going to think about plumber, for instance, or um, to think about mechanics, which are jobs where you see uh, a lot of dirt around. Uh, are you going to think about nurses? Probably not, because when you think about nurses, you think of, of a very clean uh, job, a very clean environment. And why you, you never think about this when you think about nurses? Because nurses have to clean always after, what, uh, after the dirt that uh, they, uh, they have to uh, encounter in their work. It's a work where they have, to, to, they have a lot of dirt, uh, blood, uh, and all sorts of things. But you never see these aspects. So when you give a value to this work, the uh, unpleasantness of working with, uh, in a dirty environment is not taking, taken into account. 
Uh, while if you value the job of plumber or mechanic, you're going to give a high value to the unpleasantness to work, working in the in, in a dirty environment. So uh, this is one example of uh, why um, when the, the traditional valuation of job doesn't take into account uh, aspects of, some aspects of women work, it's uh, sort of uh, invisible. Another uh, uh, cause of this is that women uh, themselves uh, are going to um, sometimes uh, underestimate their work. And uh, there is an interesting case that went into in front of the court of women and uh, who um, made a complaint uh, saying that their work was the same as uh, was comparable of equal value as work of uh, men working in the same firm but they were paid, paid less and the judge uh, of course asked the witness to describe their work and after hearing the men and the women he said that uh, while well, women work was uh, of less value so there was no reason to adjust the wages but what's interesting in this case is uh, in the court there were some uh, ling uh, people uh, who study language, linguists, and they taped all the um, witness deposition and then they heard it uh, very, very, with very scientific methods. And what they noticed is that uh, for the same type of work, women would say, I coordinate the, the person that uh, work uh, in my uh, survey department while the men was say, were saying, I'm directing this per person. So <laughs> the fact that they didn't choose the same words, of course, the judge hearing the ones, the ones saying coordinating and the others saying directing, say, well, it's of less value. And this is just some of the aspects that explain why women jobs are undervalued. So the Pay Equity Committee has to do a very careful job in, uh, in trying to um, see what, what is the content of uh, women's job and what is the content of men's job. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, now, once uh, they have um, evaluated the different jobs, they, compare the, they have to compare the wages, and wages is seen as, uh, in a very large uh, definition. It, co it includes uh, uh, marginal benefits as well as the flexible uh, compensation. And if uh, this is the third step, and then if uh, they see that there is a wage discrepancy between uh, women, uh, jo um, female jobs and male jobs of equal value, then they have to uh, adjust uh, the wages. And they have four years to do the pay equity plan. So they have to start this November 1997. They have four years to do the plan and to compare and to see how, uh, what's the wage uh, gap. And then in the 2001, they have to start paying the, to adjust the wages, and they have four years also to adjust. So by 2005, uh, they, um, the wages of uh, female-dominated jobs must be equal to, to male-dominated jobs in the same firm. Uh, and to, uh, to supervise, uh, to uh, control, and uh, to help uh, firms apply this um, legislation, there is a commission, pay equity commission, that was formed just a month ago, and uh, that's going to uh, make uh, some information available to give guidelines, and uh, also if there are reasons to believe that uh, some firms are not following, uh, complying to the legislation, they may uh, uh, investigate this and uh, ask them to redress. If they don't uh, uh, do it, uh, then the, there is a court, uh, the labor tribunal, uh, that is, has a jurisdiction on these questions. Uh, just to end, uh, I would like to say what are the possible effects on this legislation uh, from uh, what, uh, with what happened in other places where there was some pay equity uh, initiatives, as well as in Ontario, where there, there is a legislation quite comparable, while not completely, but uh, in some aspects. The payroll uh, percentage that, is, uh, that goes to pay equity go, uh, is uh, from 2% to 4%. Uh, it's around 4% of the payroll for each firm uh, that uh, may be, uh, uh, that uh, usually is uh, devoted to pay equity, for those who do pay equity. It uh, can go as low as 2% for some firms where there are many women and where is the wage gap is quite big, it can go to 6%, but usually it turns around 4%. Uh, one of the positive impacts on firms 
is that it has improved uh, the um, human uh, resources uh, practices. Uh, many firms have uh, compensation systems that have been established 30 years ago uh, and then uh, um, change bits by pieces of depending on the needs and then they are in 1997 with a inconsistent uh, uh, compensation system and many employers have found that doing this exercise of pay equity have forced them to rationalize the compensation system and they were uh, they found this was positive uh, another positive point is that it has improved the uh, work relations between unions and employers because instead of working one against the other, like in case of complaints before a uh, uh, civil rights commission, they work together to attain a given, obje a given goal. And this is one of the things that uh, have been um, underlined in Ant Ontario, that it has improved the work relations in the workplace. Uh, for women, of course, poverty, as uh, it was mentioned, uh, is a very important point and uh, uh, this uh, pay equity uh, legislation, one of the main goals was to uh, combat poverty of, uh, for women and children. Uh, and another thing that was also noticed uh, in Ontario was the increase of empowerment. Women who uh, discover what is the real value of their jobs uh, become much, much more uh, empowered and much more autonomous. Um, in the workplace as well is, as in their uh, private uh, lives. So uh, there are very positive impacts and uh, we should not also underestimate, as I said, the positive impacts on the employers and the workplace too. These are the main things I wanted to say, so if there are any questions, um, uh, I will uh, be happy to answer. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Marie-Therese. Um, we're going to come back and uh, do the questions after our, our next presenter. But um, I want to make note of the fact that at each of the sites, there are... Okay. Okay. I think we're, we're back here. Uh, again, I want to express our thanks to Marie, to Professor Marie-Therese uh, Shisha. Um, she has shared a lot of information and uh, spent, given a lot of her time to the Governor's Commission on Women over the past few months discussing the uh, Quebec legislation with us. I think it's an admirable um, public and private endeavor. I would love for us to see something like that, uh, to see us uh, do something like that here in Vermont. So we, we've talked about pay and equity. Uh, we've talked about addressing uh, pay and equity with the legislation that currently exists. We've had an example of it. We've looked at a piece of model legislation. Um, our next panelist is going to discuss what happens at the end of a woman's career in terms of retirement and retirement benefits, pensions along those lines. So, um, and she's also going to explain to us how women can better plan for re retirement given the fact that pay inequity does exist. So I'm going to turn it over to Christine Moriarty at this point. Thank you, Janet. Um, we've already heard and know how pay inequality affects our wages today. Um, we've heard from everyone that does exist and women know this um, today that it does definitely affect them. What I want to talk about is the repercussions going into retirement. So first of all, most people have heard of or plan for retirement according to a pension. And a traditional pension is what's called a defined benefit plan. And that means that um, someone who has worked for a company for an allotted period of time, sometimes it's 20 years, 25 or 30 years, will get a certain percentage of their pay once they retire. That assumes that they work at that same company for that same amount of time and that they get a large percentage of what they got paid just before they retired. Now, most women were never eligible for these pensions because they tend to bounce around jobs more often or were paid um, less money or were working in the home. These are really traditional pensions that are f actually phasing out by a lot of companies today. Why I even want to mention them, though, is that there are people who are still getting these pensions. Women weren't that eligible for them, but they are a key factor within the pension planning. When a man who does have this pension goes to make, tell the company what he wants for payout, he has a couple of choices. One being that he gets a 100% 
of whatever his benefit is for the rest of his life, which sounds great. The other option is that he gets something along the lines of 80% of what he would have gotten, but if he passes away, his surviving spouse continues to get benefits. Now, a lot of men don't, A, they don't have to choose to talk to their wife about this because it's their pension, but two is they don't think ahead. And what is, why most women are living in poverty right now, or retired women are living in po poverty according to studies, is that they are getting paid underneath the poverty level. Women tend to live longer than men, and because they live longer, inflation hits on what income is coming into them. So if a man has this option, it's good for their spouse to be aware of that and to encourage being paid less during his lifetime so that she may continue the standard of living after, after his death. The, the Social Security system also pays based on a woman's work. How much did she get paid? I mean, if you get paid, your Social Security gets um, raised up and increased according to or, or your first benefit amount gets set according to what you got paid over your lifetime. And you also have to have 40 quarters of work in, um, in invested in Social Security. Invested meaning that you worked and paid into the Social Security system for 40 quarters before you can actually collect Social Security. With women um, going into different jobs, being the, the sole nurturer at home for both children and now elderly parents, this sometimes there's lapses in the pay in the work area and in the pay area and paying into Social Security. It has to be full quarters, which means January to March. So it's something to investigate as a woman before you're even thinking about retiring or plan now. You can request from the Social Security Department, what is my pay history through Social Security? And a lot of state governments, um, some certain jobs, have their own private retirement plans and people weren't paying into Social Security when they were school teachers or at different times in their career. So they need to really plan for that. The cur current retirement plans that most people have in place now is um, 401ks, 403bs, and profit sharing plans. Now, there's nothing majorly or technical about these names. What 401k is, is a retirement plan that's based on, it's, it's developed only for for-profit companies. So if you work for an IBM or a um, Gillette, it's a 401k plan. And where the IRS came up with this great name is it's a rule in the rule books that are about two feet thick. It's, if you looked up under code section 401k, you would find the 401k plan that's described for for-profit companies. So there's no great secret to it. What the 401k does do is it's based on how much you get paid. So if you get paid um, $30,000 a year, you can put up to 10% of your pay or $9,500 in a year. So there's limits on it based on, and I, the 10% varies according to company, but the 9500 always stays as a maximum. But it's based on how much you get paid is how much you can put in and how much you, you can set aside for retirement. The 403B plan is the same, on the same idea of a plan, but it's for nonprofit companies, which means your school systems would ha tend to have 403B plans. Large universities have 403B plans, things that are not for profit. The same, they make pay, they invest in the retirement plan, both the company and the individual, based on a percentage of salary. The profit sharing plans are plans that are devised by companies to give um, individuals share in the profits over the course of the year. So if a company has done well, they might say, okay, we'll increase your pay up until three, three to 10 percent. Say they, they said, we did really great this year, we're going to give you 10 percent. Well, that's 10% of your salary that goes into this profit-sharing retirement plan. The, the dynamics and the complexity of getting paid less than the person next to you carries on through retirement because of this. The, the final example is that self-employed people also set aside money. And if there's any pay discrimination just based on a consulting factor or doing work 
um, within a smaller company, then that self-employment money gets put away based on how much of salar salary someone made. I have some dollar examples that I'd like to show you that show the base and the effect of pay on, um, on how that affects you, how much you can put aside for retirement. 5% of an income of 15000 is $750. 10% is 1500 and 15% is 2250 If we go down to a $10,000 increase in pay, 5% of that sal salary each year is $1,250. 10% is $2,500, and 15% is $3,050. These are two extreme examples, but you begin to see if someone's recording money according to 5% pay, then you definitely have a, a large inequality here um, based on that 5%. More importantly is that over time when you invest in a retirement plan, it grows over time. So its intention is that it's going to sit there. These new type of plans are very different from the defined benefit plans, which means that if you left a job that you had profit sharing money in, you could let it accumulate, either take it with you and invest it somewhere else, or let it accumulate where it is into your retirement. So this is when the differences become more extreme. Over, if you compound the money over time, which means you let it sit in the bank account at, or the investment, and it averages 10%, in 15 years, that same 750 that you've been putting in annually for 15 years will now be earning money and now become $23,800. If you've put in that same 750 and stay in the same place or the same job or continue that on a 30-year basis, you make $123,400, which means that time is working for you in the retirement scenario. However, if you're putting 10% in or a larger amount of money, you have um, $1,500 a year, you have $47,700. And you have more than twice that when it comes to the end of 30 years of 246700 The numbers really tell the, tell the story of how it grows over time if you're consistently putting something in. The more that you invest, the more that it's able to grow, but that investment is still based on your salary. Because even if we jump up to this 2,250, we, over 15 years it's $71,000, and over 30 years we have $370,000. So that 420000 that Mary Claire mentioned at the beginning is very real numbers when we start to put time into it and what we would do with that numbers had they grown over retirement time. Um, I left some space on the bottom of these handouts that, so that you could calculate that same amount of money. What is 5% of your salary? What is 10% of your salary? What is 15% of your salary? That's going to impact your retirement and definitely impact your choice of um, handling a pay inequality because it may seem minimal right now, but down the road when you start to add in, it changes it tremendously. What um, is important for you now is to note that you need to take control over your retirement, not only your pay, but your retirement planning. First of all, Social Security, the reason a lot of women are living in poverty is because they have to depend on Social Security. Social Security was devised as a system to supplement income. People have forgotten that these days. They talk about the Social Security not paying enough, not increasing enough, when really it was meant as a supplementary sy system to pay people to bring them over the poverty level. So a lot of those people who are in the poverty level are living only on Social Security. What can you do to plan and change some of that for your future? One is to look at the pay inequality issues, but two is to learn about your plan, your retirement plan at work, whether you're at a small company, a for-profit company, a non-profit company, learn about your plan. Learn what is open to you for an investment plan. Um, what your choices are to invest in and how they, they credit that money and get involved in that plan. It's one of the best savings things around is to actually put money into a 401k or 403 plan through your employer. Open an individual retirement account. The IRAs that we saw a big push for in April as tax season came down, you can open those with as little as $100 a year. So if you're involved in a plan, you still have that option in most cases. 
If you're not involved in a plan, the maximum you can put into an IRA per year is $2,000. So get that money and set it aside. It, it's a struggle when we're already getting paid less than some of our coworkers. However, every little bit counts. If it's $5 a week, it adds up by the end of the, the year. We're talking about the long-term repercussions here and how you can learn and change that. So there are individual retirement plans if your company does not have a retirement plan or if you want to supplement it. Your other choice is to, is to make some educated choices about where this money goes or where your money is going now so that you can, you can plan better for the future. Educated choices, there's information everywhere out there. There's all sorts of books and magazines available. I, I, I couldn't even begin to name a few of the books because every time I go into a bookstore, there's a new one on Nine Steps to Financial Freedom, Financial Planning for Dummies. There's all sorts of things that give you the opportunity to be educated. There's also magazines out there like Money and Kiplinger's Personal Finance that can help you learn a little bit more. They, there's seminars. Plenty of companies give seminars, some in hopes to get in business, but often just in cases of educating so that you can learn a little bit more about the financial field. This is your retirement. Defined benefit plans that were, were popular were basically a paternalistic way to take care of their employees. Now the whole society is changing and that's not happening anymore and we have to take care of ourselves and take responsibility and learn a little bit more. There's also classes. I know the Church Street Center has classes on um, personal finance and there's ones in local high schools in different areas. So check them out and learn a little bit every day about finance, financial planning and financial advice. You can also seek out some professional advice to, as far as what are your choices and where are you going towards your retirement. It's never too late to start planning for retirement. It's better to start early. The younger you start, the more you have time on your side. But it's never, ever too late um, to actually sit down and do that retirement planning. So what I want to close with is that pay inequality does exist. We know that. Two is that it, it affects a lifetime. It affects not only what's going on today, but also it affects your retirement future. But three is that you can have the power to change and to do something about that in your own personal finance situation and educate yourself so that you can make some responsible choices. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for some very helpful and valuable tips. I think we'll all find them um, worthwhile. And you'll, you'll find in your packets uh, the sheets that Christine uh, referred to earlier. So please uh, pull those out and take a look. Um, so we, we've, we've heard a lot about pay inequity, and how it affects one's standard of living, uh, one's purchasing power, and eventually one's uh, retirement years as well how it contributes to the feminization of poverty, uh, how it disempowers women and limits uh, women's independence. I'm sure our participants around the various sites have uh, lots of thoughts, questions, comments. And so now we will begin to go site by site uh, around the state to, um, to uh, listen to those. Uh, let me le let everybody know it's a voice-activated system. As we come to your site, if you have a question or comment, just speak into the microphone and we will hear you. And if you have a particular panelist that you would do, uh, like to direct that question or comment to, uh, please uh, reference that panelist. Um, now, I, I'm trying to go through my list here. Uh, do we have anybody in Canaan tonight or, or not? It doesn't look like it. Okay. So then we are going to uh, jump down to Randolph Center. Any questions or comments from Randolph Center? Jennifer, this is Janet in uh, Randolph Center. Becky Cook is here with me, and uh, we've enjoyed the uh, program again tonight. And uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. OK, thank you, Janet. Uh, next, we'll go to Rutland. Any uh, questions or comments from our participants in Rutland this evening? None at all, but thank you. Great. Thanks for being with us. Okay, how about St. Johnsbury? Questions or comments from our participants in St. Johnsbury? I'll jump in. <laughs> Great. 
Actually, my, uh, I have a few questions. Uh, first for Mary Claire. And I had some questions about the, the sources of her statistics. They were interesting and they might be valuable for me as well. The sources of statistics on Vermont labor. Um, she mentioned a US Department of Labor glass ceiling report. Is that the title of the report? And then a women's count survey from the Department of Labor. Again, is that the title of the document? Thank you. Yeah, those that is the top. Uh, those are the titles of both documents. Um, one is from the um, National Committee on Pay Equity, and the other is from the Department of Labor. Department of Labor did the women's count. It was a survey that was done several years ago. They surve surveyed. Um, women, in, including women from uh, BPW uh, members all over the, the state and all over the country that filled out a survey about work and, their, and how they felt about what they're paid and what their salary, uh, not about specifically what their salaries are, but what they felt were important issues for them. So that came from the Department of Labor. And the other uh, information is there's a, a committee, um, a national committee on pay equity that um, ha has been put together. It's a coalition of unions and women's organizations and other, organ other businesses and organizations that's based out of uh, Washington, D.C. And they have been doing uh, this research for years and years. And are so for me, they've been a source. I know for the Governor's Commission, have been a source of a lot of information. Um, I, we can get that information to you if you'd want to call the Governor's Commission. I don't know, Jennifer, is there a number? for that in the, uh, in the book or, or, or in the, the, the materials. And uh, if you give them a call, um, they can help you with that, or they can also give you my number, and I'll um, you know, get you the information. But that's where the source of most of the information is. There was also a study done. Um, some of that information was also pulled from something that was done, a Vermont Women's Economic Security Conference, which was done by um, Senator Leahy's office and a group, including the Governor's Commission, BPW, put together this conference last fall. And uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Harriet Jenkins did a very, and she, who's Director of Office of Senate Fair Employment Practices in the U.S. Senate, uh, also did a real major presentation and a lot of uh, information for us at that presentation. And some of the information is pulled from there. Again, the Governor's Commission has copies of that as well. So I, don't, I hope that answers the information, the question. Yes, it does. Um, and if I might ask one additional question mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Jean Lowell. In reference to Vermont's Fair Employment Practices Act, um, I think you had mentioned that it was broader and more favorable than the federal law. And I, I hope I took correct notes here, and this is what I'm asking clarification for, that sexual orientation and age are in the Vermont law, and that the Vermont law allows um, comparable worth to be applied. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, the first part of your question is correct. Sexual orientation is, is covered under FIPA, and age is broader than the federal law in that in under Fair Employment, Vermont's Fair Employment Practices Act, um, individuals are covered, protected against age discrimination from the age of 18 and older, whereas under federal law they're only protected oh, okay. from the age of 40 and over. Um, in terms of comparable worth, the comparable worth standard or comparable work standard is not a piece of any legislation that presently exists. That's what the, equal, the Fair Pay Act would put into place in terms of legislation. Um, the comparable work standard has been applied in case law, as courts have reviewed and uh, de de made decisions around wage discrimination complaints. Certain jurisdictions have applied the comparable work standard. Generally speaking, Vermont courts have made their decisions based on federal 
precedent established in federal courts. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Do we have any other questions from St. Johnsbury this evening? Not at this point? Okay. I'm going to go to Waterbury next, wondering if we have any questions or comments from our participants in Waterbury. Uh, just a comment. I thought this was really informative. It's uh, given me a lot to think about. Um, Jean had mentioned how difficult it is to know whether or not you're being paid fairly. You don't know what your coworkers are making. I agree with that. And give it some thought. Certainly about the whole retirement thing. I guess never considered that, how the long-term effects of not making. Mm -hmm. so, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it may be worth, I'd like to respond to the comment that you just made. I think it's worth mentioning that in order for an individual to bring a complaint of wage discrimination, uh, they really only have to make a minimal showing in order to bring that complaint, namely <clears throat> that they're a member of a protected class and, you know, by virtue of your gender, you're automatically a member of a protected class, that um, you have suffered what you consider to be an adverse employment action, namely that you're being paid less than a similarly situated coworker and that you have some reason to believe that that adverse action, in this case it would be disparity in pay, is related to your membership in the protected class, or in other words, related to your gender. You don't have to have a whole lot of information, and the information you have does not have to be definitive. It just has to establish a reason to believe. Okay, thank you, Jean. All right, I think we will go around to the various sites once more, see if we have any other questions or comments. Um, I'll check once more with Randolph. We don't have any comments to make, but it was a pleasure to hear everyone. Um, I haven't been involved in this panel or putting it together, but I appreciate everybody's work. And for those who don't know me, I'm Becky Cook. I'm chair of the Pay Equity Task Force at the Governor's Commission on Women. Thank you, Becky. Could I ask you a quick question? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what the Pay Equity Task Force has been doing and perhaps plans for the future? We've been putting together a coalition of organizations, women's organizations and state union members to advance pay equity, um, try to address the problem at the state level um, with plans, of course, going into the, pub the private sector. Um, this is the beginning. It's really a long process that, that we need to continue on and we're looking for members of the task force. So if anyone who has attended tonight would like to join us, um, please contact the commission. Great. Thank you, Becky. I'm going to swing by Rutland once again, wondering if we have questions or comments from Rutland. Well, no, but thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you once again. And once more to St. Johnsbury. Yes. I'm uh, Pat Kasperzak, and I'm Women's Issue Specialist for AARP. Uh, just seeking a little help for uh, uh, women who were teachers, who retired before 1982, who mostly exist on a pension now of about $4,500. And there is a bill in the Senate now uh, to increase that pay to somewhere in the vicinity of $5,500, that pension money. And um, I believe it's, uh, it's either in appropriations with Peter Shumlin or government uh, operations with um, Bill Doyle. Uh, the bill was originated by the representative from Fairfax. His name escapes me at the moment. Maybe someone out there can help <coughs> with that. He's the sponsor of the bill. Um, but anything anyone can do to help get that bill through 
uh, would be a boon to 500 uh, retired teachers in the state, most of whom are women, who were teaching when w teacher's pay was very low because it was a woman's profession at the time. So if anyone can help at all, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for this evening. It's been very informative and very well done. Great. Thank you for your, for your uh, comments there. Okay. Go ahead, Mary Claire. Um, Pat, I just had a question for you. Was there a number on that bill? There is, and I can't remember what the number uh, was. Uh, but that's, that's, but this, it's a uh, retired teacher's uh, a pension bill. And uh, I don't know whether anyone can tell me the name of the representative from Fairfax, because he, he's the sponsor. If you have the sponsor's name, you can uh, address the bill without the number. Okay, great. Uh, this Thank is you. Janet from Randolph Center. Um, would it be Representative Edward Paquin that yes. sponsored yes, that bill? Yes, thank you. Okay, you're Paquin. welcome. Okay, so uh, calls to our, our state senators and state reps regarding uh, uh, Paquin's bill are, are definitely in order, and yet another case of wage discrimination based on gender. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Waterbury once more and see uh, if we have questions or comments from Waterbury. No, thanks. Hi, Jennifer. How Hello, are Virginia. You? Good. Um, I have no questions. I just want to say thank you to everyone who uh, participated in this, and it was um, really good. Okay. Great. Thank you. That is uh, Virginia Renfrew, who is on staff at the Governor's Commission on Women, and uh, a great help in pulling uh, this evening together, uh, as Janet is as well, uh, who we saw from Randolph, again on staff at the Governor's Commission on Women, and have been uh, instrumental in um, getting us all the information we need uh, around uh, pay equity and uh, working with the task force as well. So uh, I think we've gone through the sites once more. I guess I will ask our various panelists if they have any closing comments, words of wisdom for us this evening. And uh, shall I uh, go to Waterbury again? OK. <laughs> any final thoughts for us this evening? Words of wisdom, huh, Jennifer? <laughs> uh, we're always looking for words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> Question authority. You <laughs> alert. Yeah. Plan ahead. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Ask a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Worthy gems. Thank you. Mary Claire. I knew he'd get back to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason I sent you out that way. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll echo what everyone else said. Be alert. Ask questions. And, and be prepared and um, also uh, speak out a lot and keep talking about this issue of pay equity because it's very important. Um, part of what we do here and why we're here is education. A lot of people don't know about this issue or don't understand it. And the more we talk about it and the more you talk about, about it to your relatives, your friends, your congressmen, your representatives, whoever, your bosses even, the more we can get the word out and maybe we can change what's happening and maybe we can finally turn this around and bring equity to um, to our work life uh, so that we can be better prepared for retirement. That's my final comment. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much, Mary Claire. Janet, uh, I do have one more comment. Sure, <laughs> Christine. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, one of the things that when you were talking about education that the most important thing around your finances is to learn is to get educated but the whole financial field and that includes pay inequality and the whole wage base has always been a male dominated field so automatically they feel more comfortable in this whole arena so it's our responsibility to make sure that we do plan for it do get as educated as possible and talk about it like Mary Claire said because that's how we're going to feel more comfortable in it it's not um, a man's world anymore and we have to change that and make it different, is what I believe, is that we can make it work with what's out there. I know I have women who come in to me all the time who are intimidated just by the financial language. When in any field, there's financial language, um, and not is specific language to their field. And if you don't know the terminology, it backs you up. Um, 
and it makes you move slower. And all this is is a terminology and getting used to and comfortable with the issues. Yeah, good point. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, uh, last week when we did this workshop, Professor uh, Shisha also shared with us the education component that was done around Quebec's legislation. And she talked about a coalition of various women's organizations uh, working to educate the public as well as the private sector about what pay e equity, pay and equity um, was, how it affected everybody, and I think even got into the points where it is actually good for business as well. If you look at women as uh, the primary purchasers out there, uh, it's always a good idea to put more, w more money in women's pockets. Good for the economy, good for the private sector. Uh, but she mentioned that it took years of education before they even got to the piece around introducing <laughs> the legislation. And um, that's what we are beginning with here in Vermont. Um, as so as Mary Claire mentioned, uh, as Chris, Christine mentioned as well, education is a key component of this. Um, April 11th was National Pay Inequity Awareness Day, and the Governor's Commission on Women sponsored a press conference at the State House in Montpelier. Uh, we had Senator Barbara Snelling there, uh, Liz Reedy, we had Elaine Alfano and Judy Livingston from the House. Uh, Congressperson Bernie Sanders was there. We had a representative from Leahy's office as well as from uh, Senator Jeffords' office as well. It was a marvelous coalition talking about the need to rectify pay inequity, not only in Vermont, but across the, uh, across the nation. And one thing that was mentioned there was the Willis study, which I think is the study that Judy referred to when she was talking about the victim advocates case. Correct me if I'm wrong, Judy. Is it the Willis study right, that came into play? Study. Yeah. Right. And, and we, one of the points that was made in the press conference was that uh, the state of Vermont as an employer should be a model for the private sector and that perhaps this is the place where we need to begin to address pay inequity and rectify that situation. Uh, Barbara Snelling was instrumental, I think, in having the Willis study done and through a few points that were made at the press conference about the fact that things have changed quite a bit. Uh, the study may at this point be a bit outmoded and a bit outdated. Uh, again, Professor uh, Shisha made that point uh, in her presentation about how things change over the years. Uh, I was pleased to hear Barbara Snelling sign on to the fact that maybe it is time to have another study done, that perhaps the Willis study uh, was a good step, uh, perhaps good for the times, but uh, a decade or so later it's time to update that. Uh, the Governor's Commission on Women will be actively pursuing this, uh, hoping to get another study done here on the state level, get the changes made uh, in the various uh, definitions and um, pay grades so that we can have the state of Vermont as a uh, a preeminent example of pay equity uh, and hope to see the private sector um, follow suit. Uh, I'm going to again refer to your packets. In your packets you will find an evaluation form. If you could take a few minutes and uh, fill that out, uh, then leave it with somebody at the site if there is a representative from the commission there or mail it to the <laughs> Governor's Commission on Women. That would be fantastic. Any further questions or comments? Um, uh, do I hear anything? Thanks. No? Okay. Rotland. Any? Okay. Hello, Rotland. Okay. Um, I happen to be an employee of the state of Vermont, and I happen to have been affected by the Willis study. Um, at the time, my position was increased in grade level, but we were notified by a statement from personnel that the increase was actually categorized as a market factor adjustment and therefore was subject at any time to a corresponding decrease if the market for my job classification, I guess you would call it, um, changed. So even though I got a pay raise, I've always had what I interpret as a threat that 
this really um, can be taken away at any minute, and it was never a very comforting feeling. Um, certainly, the position I'm in is that of a nurse, and um, at the time that we were raised, um, we finally came up to what hospital nurses could um, expect to earn, and we had really been much lower. But it still was not really um, a respectful thing to have happened. And I'm not knowledgeable about workforce issues, whether that is something that should be expected and is usual and customary. And maybe uh, Judy would have a minute to address that, or Jean Lowell, whichever. Thank you. Yeah, I actually don't know a lot about the world study. Um, I don't know. Do, do you know? I don't. Yeah. I don't know how it relates to this question. Um, when I spoke earlier about marketplace not being a defense in the eyes of courts, how they've uh, how courts have ruled on discrimination cases, those were instances where. Uh, that really involves more a, a question of whether marketplace factors can be introduced in defending a wage disparity that exists between uh, either, you, you know, the same position where there's a, a, a man and a woman in the same position or comparing um, male dominated, traditionally male dominated field to a traditionally female dominated field. So when I commented earlier on how the marketplace factor is not a defense, it was specific to situations involving mm -hmm. wage disparities between gender. How it would apply to something like the Willis study, I'm, I'm not really clear. So I would just like to say that um, I think what you said is a very important piece of information if the Governor's Commission on Women is going to seek um, another study that the task force should um, look at that and make sure that doesn't happen again because I agree with you I, I think that is rather offensive that you're being told that your job could be devalued at any moment mm -hmm. and I get a, a, a mm -hmm. pay I mean so and again I don't know enough about the studies um, mm -hmm. the will study was actually done before I came to state government so I don't know that much about it mm -hmm. It hasn't happened, has it? That hasn't happened, right? The Willis study was done quite a while ago, and that that concern that you've expressed, it hasn't happened, has it? Uh, no, it has not happened. We have continued to be at the pay grade that we were awarded after the Willis study, but um, right now there's a, like a glut of nurses so that you have a sense that you'd be more susceptible to this threat than uh, we have been up to this point. I'd like to make a comment on this issue, please. Um, please my do. Name is, I'm in St. Johnsbury. My name is Eileen Boland and I work for the Department of Personnel for State Government. And I'm aware of the Willis study and I have read the Willis study. It was done in 1985. And the recommendations in the Willis study did not mention any market factor increases. It's my understanding that the market factor increase is used when the state of Vermont is attempting to recruit um, for a particular position and they find that the pay grade they've assigned to a particular position is not attracting qualified candidates to that position. Now, I'm unaware of this threat to remove market factor, and I've made a note for myself to check on this tomorrow, because that's not my understanding how it's applied or, or un unapplied um, or removed. So I, I would really want to check on that. Mm -hmm. I, and you could feel free to call me next week on that if you want. Thank you. I have a, always kept my copy in my file. Uh, I know, my best recollection is that it says um, you must keep in mind that at any point in a change in the market, that type of thing, that this could be readjusted downward. Again, I'm not 
operating with sufficient information here, but I would, I will look into it, and I would be happy to try and help you next week. I'll give you my phone number, too. I'm oh. at 828-5612. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, we are just out, about out of time this evening, so I want to uh, once again thank our pal panelists for sharing their time and expertise with us. Uh, my thanks to Mary Claire Carroll, who is with me here in South Burlington. Uh, thanks to Jean Lowell, Judy Rex, and Christine Moriarty in Waterbury. And also, again, once more, thanks to Professor Marie Therese Shisha. Uh, my thanks as well to the staff at the Governor's Commission on Women for putting all of this together for us tonight. And my thanks to our participants around the state for your interest and concern. Um, again, a reminder about the evaluations. If you would please take the time to fill those out. If you should have any further questions or comments, please call the Governor's Commission on Women. Uh, you can reach the Commission at 828-2851. Uh, um, I think you will find the address in your packet if you would like to uh, write the uh, Commission on any issue. So again, um, I want to say stay involved, make those phone calls to Leahy, to Jeffords, to our, our state reps and senators regarding the Paquin bill and uh, join us in this coalition to make pay equity a reality here in Vermont. So good night and uh, always be pro-woman. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>